yeah, thanks for joining. And I'm going to talk a little bit about gamifying dev effectiveness today. Um, I'll start by speaking a little bit about myself, and then I'll speak a little bit about the topic. So uh, I have worn many hats in my past lives uh, across uh, multiple companies. I have worked for Comcast for about five years. I then switched to uh, be a part of Netflix's Originals journey for a while, and then uh, I've been working at Walmart. And just recently, I joined Build.com as a senior director for a developer experience. My work has usually spanned the dev productivity space. Uh, my passions are around CI, CD, and quality. Um, chaos engineering has been something that's been near and dear to my heart, and I've practiced it for the last eight years or so, and performance testing and analysis. Um, so this is sort of the uh, area in which I work. So one of the big things that I have focused on is uh, how do we think about developer productivity and overall developer effectiveness? So what do we want uh, in any company, in any team, right? We want healthy, happy, high-performing teams that can innovate quickly uh, and continue to deliver quality products to delight the customer. So if you notice the things that I've highlighted, uh, we can sort of uh, concisely say that we care about speed, quality, and developer joy, right? Uh, in most companies, the fact of the matter is that um, speed is usually the number one thing, which is we want to make sure we innovate fast. Um, sometimes there are um, concessions given to quality uh, and developer joy is usually a much ignored fact uh, unless the developers uh, sort of mention it themselves. So this is a fact. If you think about what matters, right, for any company that is innovating at speed, uh, features matter, right? How quickly are you getting the features out the door? Um, the performance of the development team matters. How quick, how uh, able are that uh, development team? How quickly can they uh, bring in new features? How quickly can they adapt to new technologies? Um, the question for developers usually is how visible is this project leadership? How do I grow? Uh, can, I, can I do more in my role? Can I increase my scope? Um, reaction time to issues like incident management, right? How quickly can an incident be taken under control? Um, and then finally, uh, most of the teams, they focus on what the manager says, right? What's uh, the loudest voice in the room? Uh, people are listening to it and they want to make sure that the manager is satisfied. But things have actually changed in the last couple of years, right? The ways of working have evolved uh, and we have evolved sort of with them, right? Currently, there are global hybrid teams uh, that work at any corporation of any size. Um, we have actually been pushed uh, to accept a remote first working environment. We have distributed teams all across the globe and these distributed teams have to be high performing. How do we enable that? So if you think about what we want in the last couple of years, the idea of healthy, happy and high performing teams has been challenged. So today I wanna to try and talk a little bit about how to get that mojo back and how to get the teams back to being productive. So. As I mentioned, we, we had talked about a bunch of things that mattered in the pre-pandemic environment, right? But let's talk about what really matters, right? What really matters today is efficiency, getting work done from wherever you are in the world, right? What matters is team culture, uh, or, or like just to make sure that the team actually is supportive of all of the things that you need to do in your personal life. And there is low drama, right? Uh, it's also important to build resilient systems, which allow you to sleep well at night, Right? You don't want to be on a call 24-7 um, doing everything. Right? And then there is uh, adaptability. Uh, it has, this last couple of years has forced us to adapt uh, and it has caused us anxiety of various kinds. We want to be making sure that going forward, we can adapt with zero anxiety. And finally, we want communication. We want over-communication from our team. We want respect. We want inclusion of ideas and all of those good things. So taking all of these into uh, account, let's define what developer effectiveness really is, right? A developer effectiveness in my mind is the ability to provide an environment for a developer to be as effective as possible to get the bottom line uh, success for the company. There are three broad areas uh, where we can take a look at how the developer is effective, right? One is in the initial developer onboarding, right? Um, starting a new role or starting a new project there is a certain ramp up time that is required for each developer to be able to get to where they can be productive. The second is day-to-day, -day, 
uh, any developer when they're doing day-to-day -day work, there is a certain amount of uh, functions that they need to do with a certain amount of tooling they need, right? Making sure that they have enabled to that, do that. And then finally, there are big refactors, big redesigns, big re-architectures, right? Uh, these are also things that developers participate in. So let's keep this in mind as we think about metrics and going forward. So uh, a brief description of what gamification is. Gamification is nothing but uh, an idea that uh, we can use incentives, rewards, or maybe something like badges, reputation, uh, and, uh, and define levels for folks to be able to uh, upskill themselves or learn uh, to be able to achieve. So incentives, rewards uh, are something that encourages folks to do more than what they can. Uh, badges and reputation are things which people get as uh, something that they can boast about. And then there's levels, right? Like we have software engineering levels. So um, in my past lives, um, in the last, I would say 10 years or so, there are many different attempts uh, I've made at uh, trying to understand what's the best model uh, to make sure that devs are challenged. Um, so the first attempt um, is going to talk about challenging devs. So um, the first time I tried something, um, I said, okay, let's challenge the developers by creating uh, a tech lead in the team uh, who would be the best example of what this team should be, right? Uh, so tech leads are the ones who can challenge themselves the most, who are going to be people who are going to raise their hands often. And then I said, okay, fine. It, it's analogous to real life, right? Uh, we usually have great point averages, which uh, allow us to determine who's uh, doing better than the other person. Uh, there is something like Stack Overflow where you have online reputation points. There is also a dev ladder uh, where people can go from senior to staff to principal uh, and so on. Um, we can also challenge developers by saying, hey, let's incentivize a growth based on abilities like adaptability, capability to uh, execute on something that's high importance. And finally, um, rewards for mentoring, right? Um, this kind of challenge environment uh, when we practice this uh, for a couple of quarters or so, we realized very quickly that there are some major disadvantages, right? Uh, and the observations that I had was um, we realized um, a lot of fiefdoms being created. Um, there was a lot of small groups that became very focused on loyalty towards one item or one person, uh, which were mostly led by ego and not much else. Right? Um, this caused a lot of anxiety, even for those who are performing really well, uh, they felt anxious that, hey, we are not part of something and, and that, that is not really making anything effective. The other observation was that there was a lot of duplication of effort because as there was high visibility work that was appreciated by leadership, multiple teams started pouring in their resourcing to be able to say, hey, we also did this, right? And this, this duplication of effort was really a time wasted and was not really adding to any effectiveness, engineering or otherwise. And finally, the most important thing that we learned very quickly was that even though mentoring was needed in most companies, uh, it is not something that can be gamified, right? It is an art. Uh, there are some people who are good at it, some people who are not. And that is something that happens as an expansive uh, sort of a broad uh, scale thing. It's not something that is a science. So using these observations, the one thing we realized was, yeah, this was a big fail, right? Uh, we didn't really succeed at this gamification attempt. So that brought us to saying, okay, you know what? If we don't challenge the devs, what else can we do? Yes, we can challenge the process. So the second attempt that we made uh, at gamification was to say, okay, let's, let's look at challenging the process. So how do we do that? You said, okay, there is a process to um, deliver um, the software. Let's incentivize the speed of delivery. Um, we said, let's provide patches for teams that are high performing. So let's move away from focusing on developers to move uh, to focusing on teams and provide badges for doing really well, right? Hey, you had a, a very clean uh, sort of uh, deploy uh, schedule for the last month. Here is a badge for you. You performed really well in a high pressure situation where 10x uh, traffic was being consumed by your team and you still perform with low latency. Here is a badge for your team, right? Uh, and then upskill rewards for individuals where you would say, this person has been doing really well. Uh, they have trained themselves on AWS uh, certification. That's great. Let's give them more scope. Let's give them more rewards, right? We also found that uh, we could create more transparency in the promotion process. So folks know exactly what they're looking for, what leadership is looking for when they say this person can be promoted from one level to another. And finally, we put started putting gating on quality. Right? So we said, let's actually have policy engines across the entire uh, software chain 
where we can say if a certain level of quality is not met, there is a, a ding or some kind of a um, detraction for that person uh, to be able to say, let's do this better. This was not um, all expect as uh, worked as expected. So the observations we had here, uh, the top one was there was a very significant speed versus quality trade-off, uh, which we had expected, but we didn't expect to the uh, level that it happened. We also realized that badges were not really popular among people, right? Which is, if you gave someone a badge, it became redundant very quickly when there was a future incident. For example, you could have an incident for a month or two, but the moment you had a revenue impacting incident, all of that previous uh, wins were lost, right? The bonus, the bonus promo eval process, the side effect of making it transparent was that it also started getting politicized. So people started holding uh, specific items in that promo process accountable to people uh, to be able to get things done. Um, and that was not really what was intended. And finally, the quality gating, um, even though it worked partially, uh, it needed a lot of training. It needed a lot of uh, acceptance within the entire community. Uh, and that was not something that it was, it, it was a hasty decision to push it through. So I want to briefly touch upon what we found with quality and speed. And I'm going to use data that is also found in the state of software quality report uh, that was published last year. Um, it was found that um, quality uh, and speed uh, when it comes to that, there is a lot of companies who claim that quality is important, uh, but uh, like 70% of these respondents who were looked in that uh, report. However, that is not always true. A lot of folks, a lot of companies tend to push out innovation quicker just because they realize that the customer would be happy to see that. Uh, so there have been a lot of quality misses due to speed. In just the last year or two, uh, we have seen a number of issues, right? Some of these issues that I'm showing are large scale issues that happened directly because there were quality issues, either memory leaks uh, or either like not fully regression tested um, um, software. All of these resulted in millions of um, so, uh, dollars of software loss, as well as uh, loss of trust uh, within the uh, within the customer. So, not really a good place to be, right? So, if you think about it, quality versus speed trade off is a genuine trade off that we really didn't want to have. We wanted to have something where we could say there is quality and there is good velocity. So, you could assume that the gamification attempt two was sort of a fail, um, but we had some learnings. Right? We had some good learnings. What were those? Uh, one was that we saw a marked improvement in incident reduction because of quality gating. If we had quality gating that said unit tests have to be above 70%, a certain num number of uh, performance tests have to be run, certain amount of chaos engineering exercises have to be done, that actually improved our incident response rate as well as the leaking of bugs to prod stop. Um, upskill rewards really boost, boosted morale, right? So we every time someone would finish a certification, there was a general consensus that that person is going up. They're actually training themselves. There was a positive reaction to them, right? Um, transparency in promo process was appreciated, uh, but it was abused. So we realized that there is something that was good in this that could come out of it, just transparency. However, we'll have to curb the abuse in some way. The other uh, main thing that, I, that came out of this was that some of the process improvements which we had gamified were a massive force multiplier, which means the team actually backed it 100% and we were able to get a lot of traction on some of the innovations that we did with the process. So it was not all bad. What we learned essentially was that in order to be effective, a developer needs to be enabled. So effectiveness needs enablement, right? This was a big learning for us. Uh, if we do not have the right kind of uh, enablement for the developers where uh, they are not able to get what they need in a quick enough time, we're not really giving getting any effectiveness out of them. We realized that we have to gamify the process. I think that one was clear, not the people, because we do not want to create anxiety in folks. Right? We want to make sure that it's a process that has to be gamified and not measuring people. We realized that there are trade-offs, uh, and thinking of trade-offs, we also ma made it very we made it very conscious effort to actually say let's choose one versus the other, or at least choose that we will lose one parameter if we try to optimize the other. This made us very aware of what those trade-offs were. And finally, in the last couple of years, we realized that remote work 
needs top-notch support, top-notch communication, as well as a lot of room for uh, making developers fail and then learn and succeed from that. So these were sort of our primary takeaways that we said, okay, you know what, let's take all of this. Let's talk about some steps to make these things possible, right? So step one, what we did was we said, let's focus on onboarding. Onboarding is that time when a developer is feeling massively unproductive. They are just coming into their work. They get a new laptop. They're setting up their account. They, they have to spend time installing packages. Then they check out the code. They start reading the documents. They start talking to other folks in their team. They start, they begin their work. And then finally they commit some code to prod. This entire exercise can take upwards of two weeks, right? Even in the best cases, uh, two weeks is sort of the minimum for someone to get truly productive. So we said, okay, you know what? Let's, let's minimize the onboarding time. So we started off saying, let's minimize onboarding time to be less than two weeks. And let's see how far we can get. So we said, okay, let's use sensible defaults to preset the workstation or the laptop with the right kind of packages, the right kind of code, the, the code environment, et cetera. For example, if a developer is someone who's coming in as a Java developer and they need the specific kind of IDEs, they need specific kind of uh, jars to be able to begin their uh, code setup, let's make sure that's already preset and preloaded. Uh, in addition to this, we paired some of the new hires with tenured developers during the setup phase, during the first week. Uh, that enabled many of these folks to actually get done with obstacles much sooner because they were really getting dedicated help from folks who have already done this in the past. We actually found that for a few teams, uh, there were onboarding uh, cases where uh, teams were able to come, uh, developers were able to commit code to prod within three days. This boosted a lot of morale, and not just for the development team, but all the way upwards to our executive leadership. And the other thing that happened as a side effect, as a good side effect of this is for onboarding new devs, the acceptance into the team was faster because there were people now working with the devs to ensure that their setup is complete, they're able to preset, uh, use their preset workstations and get productive much faster. What is step two? Um, step two, we realize is we have to do CICD. There is no way around it. Uh, I've linked a really interesting uh, exercise, a really interesting sort of effort that's taken place around the uh, world where uh, folks are agreeing on what a minimum continuous delivery model looks like. Uh, so I definitely encourage everyone to look at it. Um, what we did was we said, okay, let's define uh, clear pipelines to prod, right? Uh, it should be a uniform way to get to prod. Uh, there should be uniform steps to get to prod. And we said, okay, this gives, we realize that this gives high confidence to developers. We realize that there is importance in getting quick feedback to issues. So typically your CI CD pipeline looks like this, right? We, we start off with planning, we start coding things. Uh, those are verified or built using Jenkins or your favorite build system. Uh, you profile them or you run uh, performance tests on them. You do performance profiling on them or you do different kinds of tests on them. And then you deploy it uh, and goes to production. You monitor what's happening in production and then you come back and start fixing it all over again. So this is our continuous deploy process, right? And obviously during the continuous deploy process, you have various gates and guardrails where you starting with uh, design verification, stakeholder review at the start with plan, uh, during code, you write tests, uh, different kinds of tests. You verify using UI verification, end-to-end -end tests, et cetera. You do your security checks, things like that. You verify the performance. Uh, you do like different kinds of analyses. And finally, you deploy it and make sure that when you're deploying it, you're deploying it in a highly available disaster recovery ready uh, fashion, right? So all of this, uh, if the, we had defaults, for these, right? If you had sensible defaults for being able to test this, if you had good templates that could be shared with the developers, the developers then feel empowered to be able to do their work faster. And the side effect of doing that faster uh, means that we can actually get really good effectiveness from them. So this is a model uh, that has worked for us. There is variations of these models that different teams used, uh, but in a sense, this was essentially the blueprint uh, for that for every team. So final step, and this is really the most important step in addition to all the tooling, right? Uh, it was about 
active inclusion. Uh, what does this mean, really? Right? Uh, active inclusion is basically about making sure that folks in the team get um, understand that their opinions are valued, uh, and there is true meritocracy in the team. Right? So the leaders in every team needed to include all the ideas. So this was a this was more of a process change, but also a personal growth for many of the leaders, where they had to say, okay, let's include all ideas that are coming from every member of the team. And let's make sure that as a team, we discuss and we develop empathy for the other viewpoint so that we give it the respect that it needs, right? Um, also, when it comes to challenging or criticizing something, right? Let's criticize the decisions that were taken, not the person. Uh, and a lot of times this uh, takes practice because when you're in a room with another person uh, or even in a Zoom with another person, you tend to start focusing on them instead of the actual decision that was taken. Uh, one way to solve this is by making decisions data-driven. So then you can come back to the data, examine it, and then use that uh, to make your future decisions, right? The final thing, which is actually significant, even though it's subtle, is celebrate successes, even the small ones, right? Um, active inclusion involves people knowing that what they did, what they have done for the team, what they have done, stayed up for the team uh, through the night, or they delivered something that was thought un impossible by, uh, within the timeline. Um, those things have to be celebrated, right? And in a very public way. Also, don't isolate blame. Uh, blameless uh, post-mortems and blameless uh, root cause analyses uh, are the name of the game, and many folks in the industry are adopting it. So that's, that's what active inclusion. And this is really more about making sure that the le leadership is up to speed on this, right? So now let's put this all together. So we said, okay, we, we have now understood what has happened. And so we said, let's, let's try something uh, when we put this all together and let's try another attempt at gamification, right? So we said, okay, what does this look like? It's all about enabling developers. So if you're going to enable developers, we need to make sure that we have amazing tooling that can help them accelerate. Imagine what a developer could do in one day let's have tooling that can allow them to do the same thing within one hour. How can we challenge that, right? And the answer to that is make sure that we use community supported software. We use enterprise software that has good reputation in the market. And we build abstractions and tool teams within our area to ensure that there is support for the developers instead of them having to build everything and reinvent the wheel every single time, right? The other thing that was important was to allow teams to nominate worthiness, which means that teams typically know who the go-to person is for solving something, right? There are, there are people in the team that the team looks up to. Let's reward them. Let's allow the team to nominate who becomes the tech lead in that team. And this worked out really well because this allowed the team to say, I respect this person, I will hear what they have to say, and this person is nominated by me. So it created a lot of uh, acceptance within the team. Uh, cross-training uh, was crucial, uh, right? So you, you, you want to make sure that you cross-train all the developers. So every single level of developer knows that there is a growth path for them where they can upskill and do more by contributing to the company and to the bottom line. And frankly speaking, uh, for every developer, it's also important how their resume looks uh, outside of the company, right? So we enabling devs also means enabling them to learn new things, right? And finally, in enabling devs, we also wanted to make sure that we reward uh, empathy and passion. So we wanted to make sure we give them tools to help accelerate so that they can deliver quickly, they can deliver quality, and they can feel really good about what they're contributing. But at the same time, we wanted to make sure that anyone who is empathetic, who's passionate about the software and the work they're doing, gets that reward, gets that acknowledgement. And the second thing for leaders was uh, removing obstacles, right? Emphasis on any debate not involving the person. So egoless debates where we can bring in data, the, any, any decision that is being made should be backed with data. Uh, there are very there are teams that are doing this um, for the last 10 years or so in, at Netflix, and it's really uh, been wonderful uh, to work with those teams, right? So um, allowing teams to explore and find new paths. This is really important where sometimes we focus on deadline and driven development so much that we don't we realize that we don't realize that there could be things that the teams could do. 
right? There could be hackathons where teams could uh, create new ideas and actually explore those. So we wanted to allow teams to also explore and find those new paths, right? Um, in short, this is the, a line that I borrowed from the Netflix culture deck, which is freedom and responsibility. It's a really powerful idea to be able to give freedom to a developer and give them all the tools they need to succeed and then share that responsibility as well with them, right? So they, they feel responsible the moment that that freedom, that independence is given to them uh, to be able to create really quality product. So doing this um, enabled us to be successful so far, right? Uh, it's not been, it's not something that we have not found uh, obstacles, uh, but those obstacles removing them has allowed us to continue on this uh, gamification routine. So what were the outcomes? I mean, all of this ideation is great, right? Uh, what are the real outcomes? What did we, what did we really see uh, coming out of this, right? Uh, we are in a current state of innovation, right? In most teams that practice this kind of uh, idea, uh, the state of innovation is, is where we are, right? Which means the speed of delivery is high, even though there are extremely strict standards on how the code can actually go to production. The code cannot go to production unless it clears all the quality gates and guardrails. Uh, and in many cases, these guardrails are thresholds that alert uh, based on what is seen in the code during that phase of the testing, right? Um, teams are highly aligned on the overall goals of the organization, but they're loosely coupled so that they can find autonomy in working themselves. Loose coupling also enables team to develop their own inclusion policies for ideas and for new thought. Uh, and that enables them to get to that highly aligned goal in a faster manner, right? Um, the other thing that has happened over time is that teams understand and accept that nothing is perfect, but we have to work on it as a team. And this is something that is a major sort of uh, aha moment for teams that realize that hey, we're not gonna get everything at one time, speed and quality and everything is not gonna happen at once. We have to differentiate between what we need and that is going to provide uh, our developer joy, right? Um, so in all, morale has been high and um, very happily the engagement scores or the pulse surveys that are conducted regularly in uh, companies has also resulted in sort of seeing some really high scores, right? So overall, the state of innovation is happy uh, and we are able to provide a lot of information uh, back to the developers on how they're doing. So you can measure them, you can met create metrics. But remember that devs feel safer because they are not now being measured for what they bring to the table. Instead, it is all about making sure that there are great systems that enable their fast deployment and their fast innovation. So what did we get uh, out of doing all this? So we are coming back to what we started with which is uh, we, we have an ability to now say we have healthy, happy, high-performing teams that can innovate quickly, fairly quickly, and continue to deliver quality products to delight the customer. Um, this is the same uh, sort of thought that we had when we started this discussion. But uh, remember that through this, we went through uh, two years of pandemic. And then now uh, in the hybrid environment, we still can get to this, right? But the emphasis is on making sure we have tooling, we have the right kind of uh, sort of concentration on developer joy and making sure that active inclusion allows us uh, to get there faster, right? So if I were to just summarize uh, what, we, uh, what I spoke about and what uh, the big takeaways from this talk are is gamify the process, right? Use the pipeline. So if we look at the CICD pipeline, uh, we can take that and gamify that. CICD pipeline with gating and guardrails is nothing but a video game <laughs> that a developer will enjoy to play, right? Uh, they want to be able to get to production, which is the final level. Uh, by getting through all of the initial levels, uh, that's how they can sort of go through the pipeline, use the gating and guardrails to protect them, and then finally get to the end of the process. So equipping the team is a no-brainer. Uh, you do not want... Uh, the team to go out in search of finding tools that they can actually get help from internally. Uh, an internal tools team or an internal um, team that allows them to access all of the infrastructure easily, all of the security policies easily, is a key uh, distinction in high-performing teams. 
uh, an active inclusion um, is something that goes a long way, right? For folks who feel uh, there is not enough respect, there's not enough communication, uh, waiting to hear what they have to say uh, provides a lot of input to leadership to be able to make some significant and valuable changes in any organization. Uh, and this is uh, the be best benefit of the win-win from this is that people who provide their input also feel that they contributed towards the organizational structure uh, as well. So that's that's a big win for any company. Um, developer satisfaction. Uh, so developer satisfaction is a, is a very crucial thing when we talk about developer joy, right? Joy is when you contribute and you see that your code is accepted and everything's awesome, right? But developer satisfaction is when they feel satisfied, not just in their work, but also in their uh, home environment, right? So the developer satisfaction and the overall well-being translates into innovation. A developer that takes time off after their on-call and then comes back re-energized to be able to tackle on bigger, better issues uh, is the kind of developer we are looking for. And so that is that is also a big takeaway for me uh, from the past, right? Uh, and finally, the most important thing that came out of all this for us is that investing in tooling or efficient tooling uh, enables uh, something like now, where we are we have a remote first reality, we have a hybrid system uh, to work with, and this kind of uh, hybrid system is what I am assuming would be the future for all of us uh, in for the next, I would say, ten years or so. So, uh, efficient tooling is something that is a no-brainer and is a non-negotiable uh, in today's day and age. It allows teams to work remotely and still be productive. So these are the big takeaways. And um, this is all I had. So what I'm gonna do is then hand off to Ravi. And Ravi, are there any questions that I can answer? Yes, yes. thank you Vilas for the interesting session. I think the very good thoughts that we need to ponder about. Yes, do we have uh, around four questions in the Q&A? Let me read out uh, those questions sure. uh, to you. The first is from Manjunatha, and it says, uh, do you also see purpose and autonomy as what really matters? How would you rate them as compared to the others you listed? Okay, so I think uh, autonomy, I'll speak about autonomy first, right? Uh, autonomy is crucial for any high performing team. In fact, I feel that the more uh, teams are confident about their performance, the more they want autonomy. Right, because that provides that respect to them. They feel that, hey, we are adults, we can take these decisions and we can really succeed. Give us that and we will succeed. Right. So I feel that autonomy provides a team with purpose uh, because unless that is provided, uh, the teams do not find a way to self grow. Otherwise, all that remains is just meeting deadlines. Right. So um, I would say that autonomy I would rate very high and I would actually see purpose as a sub. Uh, part of autonomy, because I think uh, without autonomy, uh, you cannot fulfill or even find purpose successfully. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, uh, Vilas. Let's go on to the next question from Pradeep Chandran. It mm -hmm. says, onboarding, giving predefined image which, with code setup, it may be a miss of the new joiner to understand the how to set up the dev environment. What do you think? Yeah, I think... Um, that's actually an interesting point, right? So the, the the question that I would ask is how you're paying this person who's coming in, right? It could be a very high performing person or it could be someone who's coming in from a really, um, how to say, good university. Think about how you want to use their time, right? Um, when we thought about that, we were we, like, for example, we are hiring someone who's coming in uh, from a really reputed university and they we want them for their skills, right? They come in and then we are letting them figure out how to set up a dev environment uh, instead of using their skills to be able to put, put production uh, code, right? So I think that is the challenge that we saw. And we actually found that uh, setting up a dev environment over time is going to actually become easier because we're going to try and containerize things even within the dev environment. So if you look at your Mac uh, today or your uh, Windows laptop today, um, they, they are essentially trying to make things as easy as possible for someone who comes in. Imagine how you use an iOS device uh, versus what you would do with a Windows laptop, right? Uh, iOS makes it easy so that you can onboard. So you're not missing the onboarding. It's really saying, let's save you from that onboarding and utilize your significant talents in actually development of software. I hope that answers the question. Good, good question and a great response. 
let's move to the next one here uh, from an mm -hmm. anonymous attendee. Many organizations which already do these in one way or the other are still affected by great resignation, mm -hmm. where developers who are looking for more, conti more continue to move towards organizations which do not use the same practices. What do you think organizations are missing here? Yeah, so I, I sort of read ahead a little bit, Ravi, on this. So that's why I moved to this uh, slide. So we what we actually found is that even when we did the uh, tooling and we also gave enough support for folks to do onboarding and things like that, the softer skills were missing with leaders, right? So active inclusion is not really about the developers as much as about leaders retraining themselves, right? So that is what organizations are missing. And if you think about the great resignation overall, right? Uh, folks who are leaving are not necessarily leaving because something is bad, uh, but they are actually leaving because they themselves are trying to find a better place for themselves to live in, uh, to, to work in rather, right? So it's not about good versus bad. There could be politics in two companies, right? But for, for the person who's moving from one company to another, they may just feel that, hey, this is going to give me something more than this other place. And most of those are soft things, right? Uh, of course, there is money and all that involved. But if you bring in something like active inclusion, where you're telling the person, I empathize, I understand where you're going with this, it creates a lot of retention uh, bonus. Uh, we have not lost any person during that great resignation, luckily, touch wood. Uh, and that's probably because there has been open dialogue about it uh, in our company. Okay, uh, let us move on to the next one. It's a short question. How do you measure developer satisfaction? Is it a tangible metric? Yep, we can measure developer satisfaction. So uh, developer satisfaction can be measured by the uh, by multiple things, right? So there are KPIs like Dora metrics. Uh, you can utilize that to measure developer satisfaction. It's not a first order metric. It is a second or third order metric, right? Because Developer satisfaction being high means that there is less barriers to innovation, uh, which means it makes it more confident for the developer to commit change more easily and high quality change more easily, which means there may not be much incidence uh, in production. And so you could say change failure would be low. There is a high rate of deployment, which means CICD is enabled. And you'll see that uh, overall the lead times or the cycle times are going down. So you can use the Dora metrics to measure developer satisfaction in a sort of a third, uh, sort of a, how do you say, derivative kind of way. Thank you, Lars. And the next question is a bit uh, lengthier. Sure. Technology uh, from JC Ramachandra. Technology keeps changing faster. We can't incorporate all the latest ones in our project every time. Some transformation projects run for years. However, the developers, especially the junior ones, always want to work on the latest. What is your advice in managing and engaging such a set? So um, very good question. Uh, this is something that I have been challenged with uh, as well in the last couple of jobs, where we've always had folks who want to do the shiny new object in the market. They want to do that. Um, the challenge, uh, Jayashree, is that you can't satiate uh, them with uh, legacy work, right? So the question then becomes, can you engage them in a meaningful way in finding something new? And that's essentially where, uh, what we tried essentially was to create tiger teams for innovation and enabling them to do things like show and tell uh, kind of uh, demonstrations. We would reward that by giving them projects that would be more about refactoring uh, legacy code or sort of, you know, instead of maintenance based things, trying to show them how what they are working on connects back to the actual bottom line of the company. And in some cases, we actually allowed them to learn with the person who's most tenured in the team, right? Telling them how this actually gives us our bread and butter uh, for uh, the, the company. And there are challenges actually in even in legacy systems that today uh, folks do not know how to solve. So when someone shows something cool, you can always connect back saying, hey, by the way, this really cool thing. We did this 20 years ago and here is how we did it. But uh, I'm saying this, uh, I'm not saying that this has worked. In many cases, it has not worked. Uh, so it is definitely a challenge, Ashley. In fact, I would say that that's an ongoing thing to chase down is how do we engage and keep people focused on fundamentals rather than chasing the next shiny object? That's, that's, a, that's a hard uh, problem to solve. Okay, 
I don't see any more questions in the Q and A icon. Uh, thanks uh, once again, Vilas, for the interesting uh, uh, session. Thanks, everyone, and I'm seeing the chat uh, response as well. Thank you so much for the feedback.